When the COVID-19 pandemic first hit the United States, the warnings were dire. Many declare the virus knows no race or nationality. It does not discriminate. It was a warning made with the best of intentions, but all around us, it was clear the virus did discriminate, not because of biology, but because we as a society allowed it to. Good afternoon, I'm Jane Kim, Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's event, Injustice Laid Bare, a Pandemic's Revelation in American Healthcare with support from Google. The racial disparities revealed during the pandemic are indeed horrifying. Latinos and African Americans were three times as likely to contract COVID-19 than their white neighbors. They were also twice as likely to die. These disparities existed in every facet of the pandemic, in our workplaces, our mental health, and now at our vaccination sites. But what's worse is that these disparities were entirely predictable, a result of the deep-seated inequality and racism in our country's healthcare system. A country where doctors don't listen to black women when they say something is wrong with their bodies. A country where black Pacific Islander and Native American babies die at a much higher rate than white children a country where race is dangerously used as a factor in medical testing. The Atlantic's Ed Young recently examined the impact of the country's individualistic nature on our collective health. He asked, how much additive burden is a country willing to foist upon people who already carry their disproportionate share? What is America's goal? To end the pandemic or to suppress it to a level where it mostly plagues communities that privileged individuals can ignore? questions not easily answered, but ones we must collectively confront as our goal must be to end the pandemic along with the health disparities that have been laid bare by it. And while we as public health experts understand that these disparities have deadly consequences, the pandemic has forced everyone to finally see them. Now we cannot, we must not let them look away. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining this important conversation as well as our moderator today, ABC News correspondent, Deborah Roberts. Enjoy. This is the second worst day here at IU North. Yesterday, a Dr. Bannock wanted to send me home. At that time, I'd only received two treatments of the remdesivir. He says, ah, you don't need it. You're not even short of breath. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I am. And then he further stated, you should just go home right now. And I don't feel comfortable giving you any more narcotics. I was in so much pain from my neck. My neck hurt so bad. He made me feel like I was a drug addict. And he knew I was a physician. I don't take narcotics. So I started asking, send me to another hospital where they can treat me. But if they're not gonna treat me here properly, send me to another hospital. I put forward and I maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. Ah. Uh. Hello everyone, I'm Deborah Roberts and that video is absolutely heart stopping. And uh, you know, you're looking at a doctor here too, a medical doctor. And I have to say that uh, many of us know that Dr. Moore's story sadly is not uncommon in this country given the disparity of healthcare between communities of color and white communities in this country. I think people from uh, communities of color would be quick to tell you that racism is a killer. Many Americans were made aware of this fact during the pandemic. Um, and as a journalist and a black woman, I remember all too well noticing early on in the pandemic that there seemed to be an increasing number of people of color who were seriously ill and who began to die. That disparity was pretty apparent very quickly to a lot of us. Some of us already knew it, but it was certainly laid bare as you heard during the COVID-19 crisis. And this is long before the CDC declared just recently, in fact, that um, you know that this is really a major problem, that uh, racism uh, that is a serious public health threat in America. 
twice as many blacks are dying in this pandemic than whites. And, you know, the numbers just go on other communities of color too, Native Americans, Latino Americans, the numbers are really too high. And I think we all agree that this is totally unacceptable. So today we are here and we wanna thank you, those of you who are out there online, who are paying attention and who want to be a part of the solution. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to introduce our panel in a few minutes, but I wanna let you know that if you have questions throughout or maybe comments or things that you wanna to add to us, you can join us at facebook.com slash Harvard Public Health. That is facebook.com slash Harvard Public Health. Now, as I mentioned, we have gathered together an esteemed panel of experts and other vital voices in this debate to sort of understand what is happening and to really sort of strategize to see if we can make change. So I'd like to begin by introducing our panel so we can jump right into it. Please join me in welcoming first, Dr. Garth Graham, Director and Global Head of Healthcare and Public Health at Google and YouTube. Dr. Karen DeSalvo, Chief Health Officer at Google Health. Dr. Mary Bassett, Director of the FXB Center at Harvard University and former New York City Health Commissioner. Dr. Faluso Bacarede, an interventional cardiologist in the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest regions in this country. And Jeffrey Sanchez, a former state representative who served in the 15th Suffolk District in Massachusetts from 2003 to 2019. I wanna welcome all of you. Dr. Garth, I'm gonna start with you if I can, because I'm still reacting to that video. Um, and for you as a, a fellow physician, I'm sure this must have been difficult. Your reaction to Dr. Moore and that, that video that went viral? Yeah, you know, um, a number of, I think, um, black and brown physicians related um, in terms of not just personal experiences, but experiences of others, um, family members, um, patients, um, people we care about. So I think, the concept of um, injustice, the concept of health disparities, the concept of racism occurring in healthcare and public health and healthcare delivery systems is not foreign. I think it's been only not only documented in studies, but like I said, and you saw me that video um, documented in a lot of um, personal experiences. So I think um, what that video allowed us to see was um, to see the raw emotion, the raw, the actual experience unfold in front of our very eyes. But I think. Um, certainly not a surprise, I would say, to many of us who have either studied or lived um, through those, through similar experiences. Dr. Falcarede, to hear Dr. Moore talk about being regarded as almost like a drug addict, you know, and being condescended to in the hospital. Um, what was, what struck you when you, when you watched that video and so sadly, obviously ended in her death? What struck me the most is that, you know, you're looking at um, one of the probably the most um, intellectually, um, you know, bright minds um, who uh, represents 5% of physicians in medicine. You're looking at a bright uh, a woman who had a son. Um, she had goals and hopes for her son. Um, you're looking at a physician um, who, you know, gave that ultimate sacrifice, the apron of humility, which is to serve her community um, in, in her site of service and to just be dehumanized um, and to be marginalized by not only a colleague, but by a system. Um, that is what is more, more, most heartbreaking. It's because this has been a generational scar that has been pervasive and that has gone ignored for decades. Um, and it is more systemic and it was just brought to bear by the fact that she was smart enough to put a camera on and to shed light on her experience. Now, if she had not had the education to be, or the, the where it all to be able to say, you know, what, let me document this experience. Then she just becomes one of the many, the thousands and the millions who actually go and die and suffer in silence due to this systemic um, disease, the sick system of care that we currently live in, in our healthcare system that has been brought to light by COVID-19. Um, and that's what I see um, in that video. And my yeah, condolences I, goes out to her family. 
Yeah, same here. And you're right. Otherwise, you would have just been a statistic. And as you say, this is something that now we actually are discussing and it has been brought to light. And so much has been over this last year as, you know, reporting has happened, certainly on the part of me and a lot of my colleagues. We've been reporting on these issues and we're learning things, too, even daily as we're starting to make our way out of this pandemic. We continue even to learn uh, more. Dr. Bassett, let me ask you, because you know, as we begin to take off our masks and people begin to start to think that we're resuming uh, normal activities, you've reported that Latino and Black Americans who died from COVID-19 lost three to four times as many years of potential life before the age of 65 than white Americans. What do you mean exactly by that? Well, not only are people of color, and by that I'm referring to Blacks, Latinx, Indigenous people, Pacific Islanders, Dying, not only are people of color dying at higher rates, but we're dying at younger ages. Uh, so that's why we can say that the people are losing more years of life. When you die at 45, for example, uh, your life expectancy has been cut short. Everyone should be able to expect to live to be 65. Uh, but the black population, for example, has lost as many years of life before the age of 65 as the entire white population, even though we form a, a much smaller proportion of the U.S. population as a whole. So that's what we're referring to. It, it matters uh, when you die at a younger age. Uh, it means that a family may lose a breadwinner. It means that uh, children lose a parent. Uh, uh, so, it, although every preventable death is always a tragedy, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, people who die too soon, uh, we as a society are losing even more uh, from those premature deaths. And that's the key, too, when you think about what it, it has an impact on society. I mean, families as well, but also society. You know, it's interesting, my family, uh, you know, so many of us, I should say, and particularly across this country, there are, there are plenty of people of color who do have the wherewithal and do have access to health care. But we know broadly, broadly, that it is a big problem. I mean, my husband was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer not long mm -hmm. ago, and we were fortunate enough to have access to top-notch care. Mm -hmm. However... There are also other cases that, that trouble all of us. I mean, we have a good friend who, a, a man, a black man who is in his 60s who just passed away of heart disease recently. And we learned later that their insurance had lapsed because, you know, they had had some, some financial difficulties. So, you know, we know that this is a problem. We talk about, you know, racism or racial inequities being a killer. Let's take a look, uh, by the way, because somebody actually said something about this just recently about the unequal care, that it can be a, a killer. Harvard researcher David Williams recently told 60 Minutes. Let's take a look. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet with 220 passengers and crew taken off and crashing today. And the same thing happened every day next week and every day next month and every day for the rest of the year. That's exactly what is occurring when we say there are racial disparities in health in the United States. Over 200 black people dying prematurely every single day. Those are hard numbers very hard numbers and the way he describes it i mean i don't know about all of you but i mean even though you're physicians many of you you know this it still kind of gives you goosebumps dr DeSalvo, when we talk about trying to level the playing field and you know this is such a big big order of course but how difficult is this anyway trying to make change and trying to level the playing field that you know is so um unequal at this moment you know, Deborah, you said it well in the opening that this is a, um, a, a moment where we have got clarity on the part of um, many leaders and gatekeepers in a number of organizations across the, com across the country. And so we have to turn it into a movement. We can't just let this be some new stories and move on to the next thing. And I'll tell you, my experience with this um, more acutely in, uh, in another catastrophe was um, after Hurricane Katrina. And I had been practicing um, in New Orleans at the time, by that time for about a decade um, and working mostly at Charity Hospital. Our goal was to build a system that would eliminate the inequities that we saw in that population um, in, in the community of New Orleans. Pretty dramatic differences, um, you know, generational uh, lost life years uh, for, for our people in our community. 
And for us, it was a, a really a matter of thinking through what were the structural and policy and other system level changes that we could undertake that would have the kind of scale to counteract what Dr. Williams is describing. So yes, we did training to create an anti-racist health system. We leveraged the People's Institute in New Orleans and did um, mass training for everybody involved in rebuilding our, our healthcare system, especially our community health centers. But we took a step back and said, yes, it's about uh, the quality of individual level care, but what are the structures that we have in place that are driving these inequities? And I'll give you two examples. Um, one of which um, was actually the, the physical building of Charity Hospital, built in the 30s, um, designed uh, architecturally to be segregated. Two wings built in the shape of an H, one wing for white people, one wing for people who were not white, and in the middle of the core services. This is how generations of physicians trained in New Orleans and nurses and others with this in this structure that was designed for segregation. Now, when I was there in the 90s, it was technically no longer segregated, um, on the other hand, at, but by the way, that was driven a lot by Medicare policy, um, causing hospitals to have to integrate. But there were still other challenges and, and some of the, you just mentioned one about being uninsured. And policy in Louisiana was to um, basically not provide health insurance coverage for folks, but rather send them to a, a healthcare system, principally charity hospital, that was well under-resourced and um, struggling to meet the needs of the population. So not an equal um, uh, opportunity for care for the uninsured at all. And so also our drive was not only to say, let's not go back to that, just that one building, let's build community health centers, with community so that we're, we're we're creating something that that will serve them in the neighborhood and have them as part of our board structure because they're federally qualified health centers but also drug policy that expands that, that expands coverage so that they have a choice so that they have power um, because they have insurance and they don't have to just go sit in the emergency room which was the only option we had before katrina so all to say um some, sometimes as we step back i want us to remember we do have to take individual action but your point is exactly right. We need to think about how we can scale. And what are the systems that are driving these inequities that we have the power to change? And I do hope we come out of this pandemic with that, that sense of a movement and, and don't go back to what we had in the past in this country because it wasn't serving people. And you mentioned the past, and I have to say, I, I grew up in the South. Some of you may not know I'm a, from small town Georgia, and I actually remember that white waiting room and that colored waiting room when I when I was a little girl going to the doctor and as you say that those were systems that were set up in place you know a long time ago and we've got to try to topple those Jeff Sanchez I want to let you jump in here too because we we know that we have these inequities but then we lost ground over this last year and I want your thoughts on you know what Dr. DeSalvo just said trying to make up some of that ground I think you might be muted if we can get you to unmute. Sorry about You're, that. There it, you go, no problem. Thank you so much, Devin. Thanks everybody. Um, and, and again, the, our condolences to the to the family of the doctor. How devastating, how devastating. Mm -hmm. And the murder of George Floyd, uh, devastating and exposed these cracks. And how do you make up, the question for all of us is, how do we make up ground when we're in the Arctic Circle floating on pieces of glaciers? We have to try and figure out how do we, how are we gonna put ourselves together? Not just us that are part of, of this system of people who are aware and who are a part of it, but also try and figure out how does industry come play into this? How does, the, how does the world, how does the, the, the communities get together, but with those industry partners to tackle this, with healthcare systems, with public health systems, with the education system, and all this is very, very difficult. I've spent the, I spent a ton of time working um, in state government, working on health equity, and the greatest achievement we had here in Massachusetts was universal coverage. To this point, the first law I worked on was that, and in, in, in even now, 16 years later, 98% of the population is still insured, but we still hear things, we still hear these horror stories that, that happened throughout the pandemic of people being turned away and the lack of compassion in the system and how dramatic it is, as we heard from the, as we heard a moment ago, it's still dramatic and it's something that we all have to take. It's, and 
it, from my own personal example, you know, my family, my mother came here to Boston from New York, from Washington Heights back in the early 70s. She came because she felt discriminated at a particular hospital up there. And my sister had a serious condition that it needed to be tended to, but her maternal instinct felt that she needed a second opinion. Mm -hmm. She comes down here to get that second opinion and gets turned down by the emergency room with the doctors mm -hmm. at a prominent children's hospital here in Boston. And why? She's broken Spanish. She had broken English. She spoke broken English. She, you know, she, she, she didn't speak the language of healthcare. Oh, by the way, she didn't have a health insurance card, which uh, that 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 was prevalent at the time for for Puerto Ricans and for Black people in the community that literally live a hundred feet down the street from the greatest institutions in the world. But the compassion, where is the compassion within the system to be able to tackle the challenges that we have in caring for people? And we heard that over and over again over this last year in a lot of the reporting that was done. I'm sorry, um, was somebody going to add something, Dr. Yeah, Buck, already? Yeah, and then, and then Dr. And, and, Bassett, go and, ahead. And, and to, to uh, Mr. Sanchez's point, every system is designed to get the results <laughs> it so deserves, right, or it so desires. And so we have a healthcare system uh, whereby, you know, we're looking at, oh, how do we achieve equity and what are the gaps? Well, from my standpoint, if you look at the 20 year history of cardiovascular disease, when you compare rural black America to where your parents lived, um, Deborah, and um, to where uh, Ms. DeSalvo uh, practiced, Dr. DeSalvo practiced in Louisiana. If you look at the data from 19, early 1990s to now, we have seen little to no improvement in terms of the mortality, more, more mortality. I mean, I'm sorry, in terms of their the survival rates of black rural Americans in over 20 years. In let's, spite let's, of all the advancements in technology, in medical trials, and in, in, in you know, in, in, in this elusive trying to address social determinants of health, 20 years we have not seen any improvements. And so the question becomes, you know, what 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 is in play? Um, you know, we, 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 we've tried little things here, but what, what's, what's broken in the system? And it's just, you know, there's this indifference. There's an indifference that, you know what, what affects people of color um, and, 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 and people who live in low socioeconomic status regions. What affects those people probably is not on top of the list of those who control power. So the distribution of power resources is primarily controlled by a certain group and what the achievements of that group in terms of what they want to achieve, uh, both short term and long term, we need a seat at the table or else we become just what the, you know, just an item on the menu. Right. And, and, that's, what, and, and that's what we have to, we have to address that. Dr. Um, Dr. Bassett, I know you wanted to jump in and I'm sorry, Jeff, but I wanted to ask you about that though. Um, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Um, 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 Fakhredi, because there are people who are saying that there are folks who are uh, disregarded and so forth, and you do work in an area of very disadvantaged uh, folks. Do you hear that a lot from people saying that they are just sort of disregarded, condescended to, dis, dis, you know, uh, sort of brushed aside? Yeah, you know, the fact of the matter is that, you know, I live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a state that carries the highest percentage of African Americans, right? 40% um, of Mississippians are Black. Um, majority of my patients um, live here in the Mississippi Delta. Um, I moved here to address and what I call the amputation lottery. The chances of you losing your limb in America today depends on if you're black, if you're poor, um, if you live in the South, um, if you are Medicaid or Medicare recipient, um, if you uh, make an income less than $40,000 a year, um, and also if you um, have um, you know, a hospital system that serves you that lacks a lot of access to specialists. And so you put all that in a pot and then you see a state where, you know, it's, it's, it's a region where the social determinants are in play, a lack of transportation, where redlining took effect a long time ago, where these patients have to travel two hours just to see a heart specialist, um, where, you know, their diabetes is not screened on time. And so by the time they're caught by a specialist, the first option they're given is to amputate their limb, knowing well, that 80% of these people will be dead within five years. Well, we have a, we have, we heard from one of your patients. We have a video here. Let's take a look and then we'll let one of the other doctors chop in. 
stopped mm -hmm. sent me over to the womb cell mm -hmm. to get the toe amputated. Just the toe. Remember, yes. we, we restored blood flow yes. to the leg. There you go. So what happened? So once I get older to the womb cell, right. and everything, right. I told the doctor had said, you know, uh, Mr. Rucker, you're going to be an outpatient surgeon. Correct. They're going to clip the toe, they ain't going to take no more than two stitches and you go on back home. Right. So he told you they're going to clip the toe, two stitches, that's it. That's it. Then what happened? You woke up and your whole leg was chopped off? Man, don't you know it. See here? Is that what happened? It would help. See, he pulled all the scab off the toe. He wouldn't let the toe heal. So this is what the toe looked like. Oh my gosh. Now we know that amputations do happen and sometimes they're life-saving, but this is this is pretty outrageous, Dr. Fakarady. Yeah, so that is that is that could be my dad. That could be your brother. That could be, you know, that's a man who had um, you know, was in the workforce. And what transpired, what just transpired is that he was a diabetic that was not screened early, and there are systemic policies in place not to screen diabetics early. We'll get to that later. And had this non-healing wound or toe. And just like a clogged pipe in your kitchen sink, you unclog that pipe by a plumber. Well, he came to see me and I opened up and restored blood circulation to the foot. All he needed was quality wound care to mm. give him time. But rather, guess what happened? His whole limb was amputated. And so what does that mean? The evils of amputation result in one, his life expectancy now severely diminished. 80% of people in his scenario would be dead in five years. Two. The cost to take care of an amputee yearly is about over $100,000. Mr. Rucker makes about $28,000 a year. Three, in terms of the cost of the family, every family member now has to take time off to come and bring him to every single appointment for the rest of his life. So that affects their social determinants. And mm -hmm. four, you have a patient now who is costing our healthcare system a lot that we all here pay for, right? Because we all pay taxes. Close to 85% of that cost is born. That's a $200 billion a year cost. So you're you're looking at just the tragedy of just a, 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 through the myopic view of just one person. I mean, multiply this by 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 a lot of patients, not only in cardiology and vascular care, but you see it in cancer. We see it in early more, uh, maternity deaths, and so it's it's a systemic issue in play. And, right. And and we must air it out. And Man. visual is uh, something that makes it different. For, for and I want some of the other doctors to jump in here. Well, I just wanted to ask well. Dr. Faccaretti a question. For, uh, Felicia, did this patient give consent for a below the knee amputation? You know, it's, that's, a great, that's, a, that's a great question. He was told, as you heard in that video, he was yeah. told that a toe was going to take, be taken off. Now, uh, it, the average, the, the literacy level of these patients that I take care of is about third grade at best. And again, when I mentioned social determinants, the education is in play. So that was the thought and that was the consent. So he that did was not understand what he did consent. He, he didn't even really understand what was understand, happening. Right. You know, and that, and that I think is one of the biggest challenges too, that as you said, whether it's a language barrier or whether it's an education barrier. By the way, we have a question here. Um, someone is just asking, uh, who's writing into us, wants to know what individuals can actually sort of do, I guess, to advocate for themselves. And um, Dr., uh, Dr. Graham, Garth Graham, why don't I let you jump in on that one? Yeah, you know, I think um, if you look at what Dr. Fakarete described and a lot of what Dr. DeSalvo described that Louisiana, her leadership in Louisiana, and a lot of what Dr. Bassett did in New York City as well, these are about addressing systemic issues. And the thing to think about here is understanding how systemic racism plays out, certainly on a societal level, but how the different levers within the healthcare system as a system perpetuates these challenges. You showed a, a clip from the Dr. David Williams, who a lot of us um, you know, our, our, um, um, have long followed his research. And a lot of his research talks about um, how segregation in a very systemic way has resulted in the challenges that we face. So the reason I say this is I do think that the concept here, going back to Dr. DeSalvo's point and the, the, the solutions, really we have to think about on the systemic level. When we think about, you know, vascular disease and amputation, we have to think about even some of the upstream things that led to that and some of the, the challenges that Dr. Fuck already um, uh, mentioned. So I think when I think about this, I think of the system and how post-COVID do we not go back to a system 
that led us down the lines of where we got to during COVID. And that's a very, that's a very good point that you make. And Dr. DeSalvo, I'd like to ask you about that because we're talking about you know, stepping out of COVID, um, but yet, you know, we're talking about communities and vaccination and some of these very communities that are vulnerable, uh, that have, you know, high incidences of death and, 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 and um, sickness with COVID. And some of these folks are worried about vaccinations too. Do you want to talk about that, Dr. DeSalvo? Uh, certainly. I mean, I, I, let me just start by saying the the reality of course is that the data is pretty clear that that individual level racism and, and systemic and structural racism affect people's health um there, there's pl plenty of good evidence historically and then we most recently are seeing that in covid uh, there are disparate impacts on on life expectancy not only globally in the u.s compared to peers but uh, but across um race and ethnicity so the challenge is real um the action has to be uh, just as real and, and you see that um, playing out a, a bit in the, in the vaccine access and vaccination rates challenges. I, want, I think I, I just want to make sure everybody's remembering how complicated this is. There's not a single point solution to why everyone's not getting vaccinated. Sometimes, I mean, I know from my patients, it's incredibly complicated. You're working multiple jobs. You're going to have to get to the site for vaccines until so you have to take public transportation, which only runs at certain times. Uh, maybe you've got child care responsibilities for other people they're worried there's going to be a, a copay or a cost or a charge and they don't have insurance it's uh, still very true for a lot of parts in the south of the u.s where medicaid has not been expanded and, and there are plenty of folks who don't have health insurance and are concerned there are others who are worried they're going to be documented meaning put into a system but they're actually technically undocumented and they don't want to be bound by ice or other systems so those are some of the many reasons that people aren't yet vaccinated so as we're doing this work it's a reminder to all of us how important it is for public health and healthcare and the system to meet people where they are, listen, understand what are the challenges, how can we help overcome them because it's not going to be a single solution. Right. It is good, but I just want to just end on this piece because it's come up a couple of times. I think we have to also remember that where there are big, big system level changes we can make, like coverage expansion, we should tackle those. Or whether where we can use data, we built a uh, vaccine uh, equity tracker with with Ariadne, the Ariadne Labs, to find point solutions for you might need to have a vaccine desert and pop up a clinic. So there are ways all of us together can start to work on systematic changes. But I don't want it to end just with the, with COVID. We, we all have to think about how we're going to work together coming out of this to address the, the broader system level challenges that are affecting individuals and, as we've discussed, the individual right. interference. Because in some ways, COVID just sounded the alarm. And we have a, a, a graphic here, actually. I want to just show you a map because we were talking about these communities. According to Axios, in the South in particular, you know, uh, folks are, communities of color particularly are at a much higher risk for COVID outbreaks due to low vaccination rates. So, you know, you know, this thing is not over yet, and we might still see these communities continuing to be impacted. Um, did somebody else want to jump in? I, I think I cut somebody off and I wasn't sure. Was that you, Jeff, Dr. Yeah, Sanchez? Deb, I, Deb, yeah, just because I, I think that at the same time. I elevated time, you, Dr. Sanchez, and I meant to say Jeff Sanchez. No, no, no. no <laughs> just, I, 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 I'm lucky to have the lecturer position with the School of Public Health. I work for that. I work the MPA for that. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, right now, with everything that's happened and what's going on right now, I do see a lot more that I haven't seen in my 20 years of talking about health equity. When I started out working, you know, with the mayor of the city of Boston back in the early 90s, there was no social determinants of health that people talked about. There were other terms, but the real realization didn't, it wasn't really there, um, you know, universally. I feel like we have something that we're working with now, but even beyond that, throughout this entire time, everybody's stepping up to talk about it. I feel like there there is there is there is a light out there. And then with everything that's happened during this pandemic. I hear in my work and in, in the work that I do advising the healthcare clients and community health centers, I do hear, yes, there's a realization. And not only that, you do have the players in the industry, like the insurance industry and even the, the hospitals and, and other provider groups and, and community organizations talking about health equity very differently. The challenge I think is what do we learn? What does everybody learn from their own instances to try and figure out how do we elevate it to create systemic reform. The great thing that, that's happening now is, particularly here in Massachusetts, is that is happening. Um, the question is, how does it turn into either legislation 
or work that happens amongst all of those players to bring each other together. And then at the national level, we know that there is not a, there is a constant debate on healthcare, but if there's something relative to healthcare that does start brewing relative to a bill, this is the time to be able to engage that. And we do know that there are some pieces of legislation um, that legislators have been working on for a while um, to try and get at disparities directly. The and in terms of how do you get at it, how do you advocate? I think you advocate with the people that you're around. You go to, you work with your community-based organizations that may have an agenda. You also identify your elected officials. It could be a city councilor, it could be a state rep, it could be a senator. And and there, let me tell you something. Provider groups do not like legislators calling them. They do not want. They don't. They don't want to hear negative phone calls from them. Why? Because at the end of the day, the state legislators handle the purse strings, and they and those all those legislators go back to debate resources, policies, and actions relative to the healthcare industry. So I think in, in, it, when when we as our people who are in the know uh, stay connected with people from our own communities, we try and lift them up. And, and try and bring those messages with us. But there has to be a willingness, a further willingness to, to listen. And I think that there has to be that, that, there has to be those actions first, the listening so that we can continue moving. When you talk about the message, I'd like to go back to um, talking about where we stand right now with the COVID crisis and, and, and vaccination. And Dr. Graham, I'd like to ask you because social media has played such a big part in uh, illuminating um, so much of what we've known and learned about these inequities over the last year. And I'm wondering uh, what you suggest for those who have a platform, much like myself, you know, I've, I've been reporting, of course, on a lot of this over the last year and digital reporting has also been a big part of it. But give us some ideas on how those who have a platform can also help and help advance the, you know, the, the, the message and, and also try to help with these vaccination rates as we're trying to make our way out of this and not to continue to keep those inequities entrenched in the this pandemic anyway. Yes, that's a very good point. As Dr. Salvo said, you know, the challenge on vaccination are multifaceted from access to understanding, hesitancy to understanding the dynamics of the lives that people live. One of the things I often say though, and I've heard many others say is just that the, the message is as important, the messenger is as important as the message, meaning the ability of individuals like you and other folks who can relate to audiences and carry scientific information and, and make it more personal and have folks understand um, the pros and cons and have them make the right decisions for themselves and their families is particularly important. And one of the things we've done a lot of work with um, from the YouTube and is working a lot with the Black Co Black Coalition Against COVID, the Kaiser Family Foundation, a lot of the organizations that have been, um, have those grassroots tentacles and have been working to try to get information out to the public um, and using um, the voices of clinicians um, to answer vaccine questions that um, the communities might have, but also the voices of trusted sources from folks in the hip hop community all the way to um, Harvard researchers like Mary Bassett, who did a wonderful piece for us, um, working with uh, Dapper Dan. Um, oh. fashion. <laughs> that was fun. And it just, just shows you the full range in which messages can be communicated. But again, as Dr. DeSalvo said, and I think going back to this concept of system challenges, system issues, it's, it's message is one component, access is another, so many different components. And it's important for us to think through um, how we address all of those different points um, along the, the, the journeys and experience of communities. Well, we all know, I'm sorry, who was that, Jeff? Yeah, just again, anything that has to do with social media relative to the immigrant community and the, the, it, and remember all immigrants, Latino and, and, and beyond, the level of disinformation on social media and immigrant communities is beyond reality. And if mm -hmm. the things that you hear and re, they hear uh, through social media, uh, right. you know, I saw one the other day, said, te va a caer el pelo, si te da, si te da, si te da el COVID, si te, si te da la vacuna, your hair is going to fall out if you, yeah. if you give yourself the vaccine that's yeah. only one there's thousands of it and they're they're not right. coming from here in the states they're from from outside from all over exactly yeah, I we're, know. Not a, we're not in a, in a show anymore I've heard that. I've definitely heard that. And I mean, my Russian manicurist had actually was showing me something once that she heard that was misinformation. Well, at the core of a lot of this, and some of us, we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, the mistreatment, the maltreatment that people are getting. And that also creates hesitancy too, because a lot of people just don't trust the system. I want, I want you all to meet someone. Her name is Shirley Cruz Taylor, and she feels that her family was misled and mistreated by the medical establishment. Let's take a look. Each time I'm asked to 
speak on my brother or I reflect on the life of my parents, I do feel a lot of emotion. I'm the oldest child, there are seven of us. My brother, Jamarcus' health started to fail. He started gaining weight so he could barely walk. He was out of breath. Then he started dialysis. He had to go five hours, three days a week. He wanted to get on the kidney transplant list, but they told him he had to lose 25 pounds. The information he received was not correct. He did meet the criteria to be on the kidney transplant, but yet he had to go to dialysis for eight years. We're dealing with um, institutions and systems that are collaborating to withhold information. It's not only systemic racism there in Alabama, but I know that it's all over. My heart is broken, but I'm determined more than ever to be a voice and an advocate. If one person is saved from the suffering that I've seen at the hands of doctors that were supposed to be people that we trusted, then I'll do what I have to do. I'm more motivated now than ever before. Uh, and to be clear, uh, Jamarcus lost his life to COVID. Um, his pre-existing conditions that was eight years of dialysis certainly didn't give him any um, uh, strength in his body to fight, but he lost his life um, to COVID. And Shirley, you're here with us now. And, and first of all, our hearts just break for you and your family and, and you have our deepest condolences. You know, what, what, what are your thoughts as you hear us talking about uh, the inequities that exist today and what can and should be done to make sure that your brother's uh, experience doesn't happen to someone else? First of all, Deborah, thanks for the opportunity to be here to speak on behalf of my family and all the families who've lost loved ones. And I just want to say how appreciative I am for the caretakers and the frontline workers who are doing the right thing and doing the best to take care of those who are affected. Um, what I would love to see is that systemic racism be eradicated from the medical community. Um, this collective failure of organizations to provide appropriate services to people of color. Um, what I would like to see is the exchange of knowledge equally. Um, knowledge is power and institutions know this. Um, let's keep and find courage to speak up. Then change the system. Don't accept everything as truth. Verify. Um, don't be afraid to call out injustice. It takes just one person to make a change. Do what you can. Develop a collective effort to work together and just know that avoiding conflict or going along to get along, that mindset no longer serves our community. I would also like to see people of color in our community get the same care as others, share the knowledge. In the future, I would like to see a system established where there can be educational outreach to inform people of their rights, um, to create um, hotlines that are manned by independent health professionals outside of these large facilities where patients can verify information and make it user-friendly. I would love to see um, the education to help our community understand that caseworkers or hospital patient advocates are not advocating for you, but for their employers. We must never forget that these people work for medical institutions and there's no objectivity. There is a strong lack of trust in the health system and our culture. There's often a fear of doctors and sometimes it's hard to get a family member to go early or to go regularly for health care. When talking to a family member recently who's had symptoms and I was trying to encourage him to go to the doctor, he said to me, let it be a surprise. Sometimes we are afraid what the doctor might tell us. You know, uh, we all fear to go afraid. Get someone to go with you. And for me, um, like Rosa Parks stated as to why she didn't give up her seat in the Montgomery boycott, she said that she didn't give up her seat because she was tired physically, but she was tired of giving in. And right, her words right. even more powerful today. Resonate. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. And you and you and Shirley, yeah. pardon me, but you made you made, you made a very good point just now when you said going along to get along, and that does happen a lot in communities of color and disadvantaged communities. People don't want to rock the boat. I'd like to bring Dr. Mary Bassett in, though, Shirley, and thank you so much for your time um, and and our condolences to you and your family. But I want to bring in Dr. Mary Bassett here to talk about, you know, how, how we can try to get this right and what you know, what we can do to try to make this a little bit more equi equitable and fair, given some of what you heard from Shirley just now. Yes, thanks, Shirley, for sharing your story. And, you know, I'm a physician myself, and I, I doubt that there's any person of color, regardless of what their professional training is, who hasn't encountered personally uh, the racism of our healthcare delivery system. And, you know, I, so this is a, a lot of, of what we see. Uh, relates to people's stereotypes of uh, what of, of uh, people of color. Uh, but I, I think one of the things that we've heard today from, from Karen is that it's not just the um, implicit or even explicit bias of, uh, of healthcare providers. It's also the systemic factors that people of color go to hospitals that have, you know, are hugely under-resourced. Uh, they have, they're under-resourced in terms of staff, uh, they're under-resourced, as Dr. Uh, Faccaretti was mentioning, in terms of specialists, they're under-resourced in terms of equipment. And uh, so that is literally in inequality in concrete, and that has to do uh, with, with the way in which we funded healthcare delivery in this country. And we have to look at uh, how we ensure that there are, there's equitable funding so that we should have, in fact, the very best hospitals in terms of their capacity available to communities with the highest rates of disease. And instead, we have the opposite. So yep. some of these questions we can't solve as individuals, but mm. some of them we can. We can insist that there be bias training. We can mm -hmm. advocate for more uh, admissions into medical schools. We are now at a level that's about the same as when I went to medical school. We've made, you know, hardly any pro progress in terms of the proportion of African Americans, most still trained in the traditionally African American medical schools. Uh, and we can ensure that people know that they have the right to advocate for their rights, that they don't uh, have to accept disrespectful treatment that they, that's what we saw Dr. Moore doing, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, she was advocating for her rights by going to social media. She was right. 53 years old. You know, uh, um, I know you're absolutely right. And it looks like Jeff, you want to jump in here, yeah. but uh, you know, hearing uh, Shirley talk about, you know, some of those cultural factors that can contribute. Um, and, you know, clearly, you know, in your community, the Latino community, you talked about that just a minute ago too, about the cultural factors that contribute. Um, as Dr. Bassett said, certainly doctors need to be aware of that, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain you're probably also thinking about the community being aware that that is even happening to them. Well, I think, you know, uh, um, Shirley, thank you for having the courage, the strength, and the power of your soul to, to be with us here today and, and, to and to find your voice the way you have. Um, and frankly, you have given everybody a blueprint with clarity today, and thank you for that. Um, and, and Dr. Bassett, you and I have been working with a lot of policymakers for a long time. And here in Massachusetts, and we live in the land of plenty when it comes to health care, half of the half of the 40% uh, of the state's budget is devoted to Medicaid alone. The, having a Medicaid card in Massachusetts um, equals any commercial any commercial insurer. They're getting paid now and they're getting paid in volume. The question is, how does it translate? Not only, and that's just, that's just Massachusetts, but as a nation, how much do we spend? And, you know, the, yeah. the question is, how do we make sure that the spending is equal, is equal not only in terms of the dollars, but also in terms of the treatment? And I think, like I said, I think Shirley did a great job uh, giving us a blueprint to think about that. Transparency and engagement with communities. We spend an inordinate amount of money on translators. How is it that the number of Latino doctors that are out there are still in the single digits? As right. well as um, the number of black doctors, single digits. What are we doing to make sure that, that, that programs are looking to increase their numbers? I do see increases in people of color. I don't necessarily see black and Latinos 
and right. that for and for people um and for people you know like myself and others that are trying to seek that that are trying to break down those barriers and find that transparency it's not all going to be in the technology we're still a people of engaging with each other on a personal level you know in in the community that that, that i spent some work doing on that we have a line of community health centers that do great work we still struggle with what people hear from the outside, as I mentioned, and how they're going to and how they utilize the systems to better themselves and, and and provide better care for their families. So we we still have a significant amount to do. But again, I still feel strongly that right now we 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 can meet the moment because everybody's talking about it right now. Everybody's talking about these injustices, and this is this panel that we're doing today is just another example of that. I think you're absolutely right. We are finally actually meeting the moment and having a conversation because I think isn't at the end of the day the conversation is what is so important Shirley Cruz Taylor thank you so much for bringing your story to us and please please know that your family has our you know deepest deepest condolences I want to talk to Dr. DeSalvo though about um, you know you were assistant secretary of health and human services and you spent years on the ground in New Orleans as we said earlier uh, now you're in charge of Google Health how do we redesign? Because so much of this is going to be about sort of recreating, right? How do we redesign and innovate this healthcare system in some ways, maybe from the bottom up? All right, I'm gonna to try to be short because it's a big, it's a <laughs> that's big a and big really one. important. That's a big one, I know. But I, I do, I do wanna um, surely say thank you to you for bringing such honor to your brother and using his story to give people power. I, I can't um, say enough about how important that idea is that he got um, disparate care in a system because of the color of his skin. And we see that in the data actually, um, particularly with, with end-stage renal disease and dialysis. And so not only in that condition, but more broadly, it's this notion of how do we um, bring the power, not only because people have a voice, but because they have a vote and they have decision-making rights. And all parts of the system are transparent and accountable to seeing that we're gonna drive equity. And, and it starts with, yes, those individual interactions. It starts with the algorithms that we build that help make decisions about care and, and the data that informs those. It starts with making sure that people have the power of insurance coverage that's strong, meaty, however you wanna describe it, that allows them um, to, to make choices about where they get their health care and have, and have some say in, in the quality of that care. And it's, it's got to include uh, transparency and accountability for the entire system. The healthcare system, including uh, measures around health equity, which I believe this administration nationally will be working towards and, as well as others, but to make sure that we're not just looking at what is the care in that one hospital, but how is the community doing? What are the, what, what are the rates of disease, the rates of wellness and health and longevity more broadly in community? Um, but Deborah, I just want to take a moment to say something about outside of the healthcare system, because th though I am at Google Health, we think a lot about um, our accountability and responsibility broadly as a company. And uh, much of much of my life, I have learned that public health uh, or addressing the public's health is what we do together to create the conditions for health. And that means that everybody has a role to play and every organization has to look at themselves in the mirror with clarity and humility and say, where are we in this journey with, to equity? And where what is the next set of steps that we have to take? They have to think about building equity into the entire life cycle of the, the products or services that they build and deliver. And, and again, making sure that there is a accountability and transparency and that they're given power to the people that they serve because they're really a part of the process uh, along the journey. Yeah, these conversations about equity. And I also have to say too, that I think that we also have to get the messages out to these communities too, that they have not only got to advocate for themselves, but take care of themselves too. I was on my way to the gym this morning and thinking about my community and you know how many people don't really prioritize their health too and the things that they can do. But we do have a question here from Kim who says, she wants to know about representation in the medical field. How can that help lessen medical racism? And I think that's key. I have a niece who just began her residency in, as an OBGYN, and she talks a lot about this. I don't know which one of you might want to talk about representation and why why that's so important. I can, um, Dr. Fakaretti. Yes, Go I ahead. can take that. I think um, you know the physician-patient concordance is very important when you talk about addressing, you know, bridging the gaps in health inequities. As every panelist has mentioned today, and even with Jamarcus's story. 
um, to understand how these patients um, maneuver or, or go through the system where they could either be lost through a fragmented system, be it systematic or be through the, the, the healthcare practices of the medical practice that's involved with that patient. Um, what you see as someone who is of color, who represents a physician, a, a patient population that I serve, um, you understand their social determinants. Um, and also you elucidate those factors that have led to those fact factors being in play. And what it facilitates, once they can see that you have both that technical and interpersonal competence, what that facilitates is facilitates care seeking behavior um, and they come to you for even things that are even beyond your scope of practice. Um, that's important. Why is that important? Because that means that it's a point for you to educate the patients, inform to transform as I tell them, and they become community navigators and spread that out in the community. So you meet them where they are. We go to their faith-based organizations or their civic organizations and have those difficult discussions. But also you tell them that, you know, there is some personal responsibility too that's needed where you do not become that statistic. Mm -hmm. And also we use our, our, our and agitate all levers of power whereby we get our uh, politicians involved. I think, you know, there are intentional policies that were created Therefore, intentional policies are, need to be created to solve those problems and to address those gaps. And um, I did that here in Mississippi by being involved in policy. Although I didn't have that background coming in, I realized that, yeah, I not only had to publicize the injustice, but I needed to go to Washington, D.C. and talk about how this amputation epidemic needed to end. And it led to introduction of legislation. And that's very important as a, as, as a physician, using your patients, bringing them to the table and letting politicians hear what's going on in their districts. Mm. And to Jeffrey's point earlier, and then that weaponizes and, 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 and empowers your patient so that their voices right. become now that megaphone. And that's, right. that's, that, that's why it's important. And as, as someone of color serving in a primary uh, minority population, I found that very useful and very empowering, uh, not only for myself, but for my community at large. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Graham, do you think YouTube can help with that message? Because, you know, again, we're talking about social media. Yeah, so we have to think through the journey of how we get more black and brown physicians there. It's, it's a pipeline. Um, you know, you start with the kinds of educational activities that start with, you know, the first couple of words. And so understanding really how we get communities and how we get to the numbers where we have um, an, an improvement. Um, we haven't seen much improvement, Deborah, as you just pointed out, especially for black men physicians, it's about the same numbers that we've seen in the 1960s and the 1970s. So if you take that as an arc, the arc really just circles right back to where we are. But going back to the role of platforms like ours, you know, this idea of both raising awareness so we understand the magnitude of the challenge, this idea of articulating and being a voice for the community and being a voice for those who have thoughts and strategies and also thinking through again, going back to this issue, I know uh, Mary and Dr. Fakhreddin and um, Dr. DeSalvo talked about articulating the system, the, being the voice for the, the, the changes we need in the system and for physician diversity, it's a pipeline challenge and making sure we're addressing the full range of challenges that we need to get um, a black and brown um, of folks through the pipeline is particularly important. Well, having these discussions about the uh, system are, you know, so uh, deeply important. And, you know, many times we've uh, seen these voices that have been out there. In the New York Times recently, there was an article written um, by Damon Young titled, Racism Makes Me Question Everything. I Got the Vaccine Anyway. And he writes something very interesting, says, Existing in America while Black requires a ceaseless assemblage of negotiations and compromises, even while recognizing the anti-Blackness embedded in society, participation is still necessary to survive. And his point is that, you know, one we don't really talk about all that much is which is that many Black Americans who might have their questions and, 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 and you know, may suspicions about the system feel that they have to, you know, participate anyway. And, and, and it's so interesting because they, they, we know the Tuskegee experiment. We know there have been examples over the years where blacks have full reason to be distrustful of the system, but yet, you know, they, they don't get vaccinated, right? If we don't participate, you know, that becomes an issue, right? And Deb, they've heard of Tuskegee and Puerto Rico, the sterilization experiments that happened on women. I mean, they're out there, but mostly 
they just have to go down to the hospital and experience some things themselves. And that's, it's, it's happening. Exactly. Yeah. I got kind of tired of people keep referencing Tuskegee, which ended in 1972. It's really people's everyday experiences, uh, both yeah. within healthcare and outside, uh, which have generated the kinds of um, uh, levels of concern. Um, but these. I know it's an words. old it's an old example, but people do still talk about it, though, Doctor Bass. They sure do, uh, but I'm not sure that that's what's keeping people away from being vaccinated. That's all I'm saying. I'm just echoing. I think what you've just said, Jeffrey, that it's also you know the fact that these can, these historical examples are reinforced by everyday life, and that's what really. Um, what really, um, you know, the kind of stories that, that we just heard from Shirley. Um, right. Uh, and we heard uh, the plea for help from from um, from Dr. Um, Susan. Um, so, so, yeah, Dr. 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 Moore. So. Dr. Moore. Well, you know, as we, uh, you know, we could, we could explore, there's so many topics and so many other things that I want to get to, but as we start to wrap up, you know, we are, we're, we are talking about coming out of the pandemic. People are getting back out there now. They're taking off their masks and going on vacations. And I was seeing this morning, they're jumping on cruises and, you know, I wanted to start to put this behind us. And of course we know it's not completely behind us. We are hearing about that, about that variant that's coming out. And with people, of course, who aren't vaccinated, that becomes a bigger issue, but I'm wondering Wondering, you know, as we try to take the lessons that we have learned and that have been laid bare as a result of this pandemic, if you feel, and Mary, I'll, I'll let you finish mm -hmm. up because you were just sort of talking about that. And I'd like some of the others of you to jump in before we wrap up. You know, are we any closer to making a dent in trying to sort of at least address these inequities and begin to make some change? Well, like a lot of people on this panel, I've been thinking and talking and working on these issues for a long time. And I, I think the level of conversation within our society is one that I haven't seen in 50 years. Oh, uh, and that's encouraging. That, and that's encouraging. Uh, it is a really big problem. And I was really glad, Karen, that you mentioned that we have to think about people's lives outside of healthcare. We have to think about what's going on where they live, what kind of jobs they have, what kind of transport they have to those jobs, what their opportunities are to exercise when you work two jobs and have a family that you have to look after, you know, how are the parks? So we're talking about something really big, uh, but we've just experienced something really big, 600,000 lives lost. Uh, so I think that we are positioning ourselves to undertake the broad uh, multifaceted hard work that it will take to have a more equitable society as well as a more equitable health care system. Dr. As, a as, a, as a former policymaker working in the legislature um, for many, many years, I felt like I was the canary in the coal mine talking about health equity, talking about social determinants, talking about scope of practice, talking about finance, health care finance, equitable, equitable health care finance. And now I hear so much th this conversation happening that didn't happen before. So all of your work and everything that's happened, it, it's happening now. We just have to meet the moment. Yeah, and it's not, these are hard conversations. They're not comfortable conversations, but we are having the conversations. Dr. DeSalvo, uh, optimism? What are your feelings at this moment? I, I actually feel optimistic. I think we have the attention of the right um, policymakers and leaders, as well as the average person on the ground. So now it's our job to be strategic and intentional and act with and act with as much swiftness as possible to make this a new normal as we come out of the pandemic and not go back to the way we were. Dr. Faccaretti, final thoughts? I think that, you know, we, um, we've seen what COVID has done in terms of you know, unblinding the injustices that have existed for decades. As a cardiovascular specialist, you know, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. And African Americans actually bear the largest burden, not only now, but for two, the next two decades. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only 5% of African Americans have been enrolled in all clinical trials to date. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, you know, we talk about historical trials and what daily experience is, um, to bridge that gap, I mean, it's going to take, as again, intentional actions, but also strategic, where we're not only addressing preventative strategies, but there should be more emphasis on prevention. Let's figure out why these people are jumping into the stream, not pulling bodies out of the stream. 
Mm. So let's, let, let, let upstream preventative strategies are very important and we're going to a value-based care system. And to do so, we need to address the ever elusive epidemiological catch-all of all non-medical issues, which is social determinants of health. When mm. we address that and we intentionally bridge that gap, I think we will see a significant dent in terms of the health disparities that, uh, that we've seen. Um, Those are powerful words. See why people are jumping into the stream rather than just pulling bodies. Dr. Graham, I'll let you wrap it up for us. Yeah, you know, my, my mom taught me about hope and hope, um, hope um, moves us into different places. So to Dr. DeSalvo's point, you know, I have hope. I think awareness um, is the first seed and hopefully what we'll start to see is the fruits of action. So, so positive, um, um, taking my mom as I often do into everything, um, positive um, uh, momentum, hopefully, um, but I'm definitely hopeful around um, uh, potential of where we can be next. Those pearls of wisdom from mom. Well, hope is definitely what we have to have. As John Lewis always said, we cannot lose hope because that's all we have. Dr. Graham, Dr. DeSalvo, um, we just want to thank you so much. Dr. Bassett, Dr. Focolati, and Jeff Sanchez. It has really been a pleasure um, to talk to all of you. And I also want to thank uh, Dean Williams, uh, Dean Kim, and the T.H. Chan School of Public Health for having me here today because this is such an urgent discussion. We're just beginning it here. We're certainly not ending it, uh, but we certainly are trying to uh, create some ideas and some thoughts for strategy. And I think you've put us on the road to that, all of you. So thank you all for joining us out there. Thank you for, you for, thank you for your questions. And thank you to the panel again and all the best to all of you.